Coming up on Tech News Weekly, Jason Howell is out, but I am here and excited to be joined by Jason Snell of Six Colors. We talk about WWDC, that's Apple's Worldwide Developers Conference. We talk about the software you can expect later this fall without getting too far into the weeds. Then Dave Gershkorn of Medium's One Zero Publication joins us to talk about facial recognition technology before I round things out with my story of the week, which just so happens to be about facial recognition technology as well. All that and more coming up on Tech News Weekly. Tech News Weekly is brought to you from Twit's LastPass Studios. Stay in control when it comes to your company's access points and authentication. LastPass makes enterprise-level security simple for your remote workforce. Check out lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is, is Twit. twit. is Tech News Weekly, episode 139, recorded Thursday, June 25th, 2020. This episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Barracuda. Did you know that 91% of all cyber attacks start with an email? Well, to uncover the threats hiding in your Office 365 account, get a secure and free email threat scan at barracuda.com slash TNW. Hello, folks, and welcome back to Tech News Weekly, the show where every week, we, in this case, I talk to and about the people making and breaking the tech news. Jason Howell is uh, out this week, and I'm very happy for him. It's uh, nice to, to get a break when you can. And uh, I am happy to be doing the show here from Twit's Last Pass Studios. Uh, first up, you may have heard that there is, uh, or yeah, currently going on right now is Apple's Worldwide Developer Conference. And, you know, there's a lot that's been announced and there's a lot that was rumored and some things that were rumored didn't end up happening and some things that ended up happening were not rumored. There's a lot to sort through and I'm so excited to have Six Colors own Jason Snell here to talk about WWDC. Hello, Jason. Hello, Mr. Micah Sargent, and my name is only a couple letters off from Jason Howell, so it's uh, close enough. <laughs> That's a good point, yeah. Uh, now, where where are you reporting to us from currently? I am in front of a green screen in front of Apple Park. <laughs> I like it, I like it. Uh, do they have fake bees in this green screen? Oh, I hope not. If they could fake <laughs> sting me then, that would be bad. <laughs> Careful. Uh, so let's let's get right into it. Um, I think that we should probably start with uh, some of the stuff that that Apple started with, and uh, of course, it seems that that means iOS is the big platform. And there were quite a few announcements made, but I was wondering if you could kind of talk about um, sort of the overall additions or changes that are taking place uh, in iOS, sort of what can the average person uh, look forward to? This is, of course, a developers conference. And so a lot of it is sort of the behind the scenes goodies that will make you know new apps and new features for new apps. But as the average iOS user, they're ready for the next version of iOS when it comes. What can they expect to see? Right. When, when this ships in the fall, iOS 14 will have... Um a bunch of features that will be readily apparent and that people will use. And then Apple is also laying the groundwork for the future in a lot of ways with some features that I, I think we won't really see in the real world uh, to any great extent for a few years. But the immediate stuff is going to be changes to the home screen. The home screen on the iPhone is largely untouched since 2007, essentially. Um, and so now Apple has been had these widgets that are kind of like widgets in Android, but they've been hidden away kind of on a side screen. They've redesigned them now, and they're all sort of like the shape. They fit within the grid of the iPhone screen. They either go all the way across or they go part of the way across. You can make these little widgets. You drag them out. And so it's going to radically change what your home screen looks like if you use these widgets because you could have a little block that where four apps used to be or where six apps used to be or where eight apps used to be. You could have a whole page of your home screen with nothing but widgets in it. So I, I think it's going to be cool because widgets are fun. I, I I think we could overstate them. You know, they, the widgets are <laughs> yes. just 
Uh, they're just little uh, viewable extensions out of individual apps for glancing. Um, I think they're taking a page from the Apple Watch a little bit in building these kind of glanceable items. But, you know, you're going to be able to add information to your home screen in a way that just Apple has steadfastly refused, even though it's been available on Android for a long time. Apple did it in their own uh, in their own special way. And similarly, uh, it used to be that every app you had on your uh, on your iPhone had to be visible somewhere in a folder or on a on a page of your home screen. And there's a new feature called App Library. And basically, you can turn off all those extraneous extra pages with, as we said on another podcast earlier this week, sort of folders full of garbage where you got to put them somewhere because they got to be on your phone. <laughs> but what happens to them? And that's something that uh, that you're going to be able to turn off. You can literally turn off all those extraneous pages of your home screen. And instead, the last page of your home screen is this thing called App Library, which is basically uh, kind of like machine curated list of apps. Uh, it's a search box. It's a uh, it's some Siri suggestions. Uh, it's basically trying to show you all the rest of the apps, but you don't. Uh, Apple is admitting you don't need to actually have every app that's installed on your iPhone visible on a page of the home screen. So you put those two together, and I think the home screen experience is going to be kind of hugely different. Um, and that's the stuff people will see in the fall. The rest of the stuff that they're doing, there's some interesting stuff involving using your iPhone as a car key. Uh, for mm -hmm. example, and there's this thing called App Clips, which is trying to um, make you load little tiny slivers of apps faster um, involving like QR codes or NFC readers and things like that. I think those may work and be a big deal, but it's going to be a few years before we actually see those in the real world. Yeah, I think that's uh, that, that last part, especially because uh, Leo and I had talked on iOS today following the, the keynote and kind of some of the things here where, you know, NFC uh, tags have have come and gone and come again and how they do or don't work. Same with QR codes. And, and so I see the uh, potential for these technologies. But yeah, I think that uh, th they're a little farther out as not only the developers start to understand good uses for them, but we start to see examples of good uses for them for people to actually want to use right. them as opposed to going, what in the world is this? Uh, one of yeah, even, even if it works well, it's going to take a while. And we don't know whether it's going to work well because, of course, Android has had slices for a few years and nothing has come of it. Then again, Apple's shown with Apple Pay that you can, if you're Apple, sometimes make a thing happen that nobody else <laughs> has been able to make happen. But even so, you're going to have to put these codes everywhere and you've got to build new versions of apps to support this. And it's, it's going to take years before you can walk up to a parking meter in a city you've never been in before and tap it and instantly pay and walk away without having to download a big app from the App Store. It's going to take a while. Yeah, can't wait, though. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed is more of a sort of cultural uh, it's tied to pop culture, especially our group chats, group messages, group conversations. And Apple has made some updates to messages that I can see my family uh, getting excited about. And, and I use my family as an example of folks who aren't, you know, steeped in this, paying attention to it every day uh, and in and out. Could you talk a little bit about what Apple uh, announced with messages coming in iOS 14? Yeah, a bunch of changes. Um, you can pin different conversations to the top of the list, which is great if you've got some ongoing conversations or important people in your life and you want to make sure they're always at the top. Uh, you can reply to specific messages in a thread. It, we all are in iMessage groups that are that are way too chatty. And you have this <laughs> moment where you think, you know, I don't want to turn off notifications, but at the same time, I just can't have this happen where I get notified every time anybody says anything. So you can now uh, mention people as well. So you can say, hey, Micah, check this out. And that will ping you with a notification. But I not like every it. message has to. And it, it's some stuff that we've seen in lots of other messaging apps over the years. But Apple controls iMessage and controls the messages app. So to add this stuff into their infrastructure, it's going to have a direct benefit on people who spend a lot of time sending messages around in the messages app. And, you know, I think most iPhone users do, especially in the US. Yeah. So let's talk about how iPad OS 
differs from iOS 14 in general? Is there anything that we can look forward to that's kind of just for iPadOS? Because originally that split between the two of iOS and iPadOS uh, was a little bit more clear. And there were features that iPad was going to get that the iPhone was not. Uh, but with this with this sort of iteration on iPadOS, what are some of the things that folks can expect? Well, first we should say the new widgets in the home screen are not on the iPad, nor is the app library. Those are apparently iPhone-only features, which is kind of weird. The widgets will still be in, available in a little sidebar on the iPad on the first screen, but that's it. Um, in terms of new features, there, there are some. Um, the, I, I would argue the biggest change to the iPad was this spring when they added pointer support, so they already rolled that out. Um, I, they are really excited by this uh, new pen, new Apple Pencil <laughs> stuff uh scribble lets you write out words in just with the apple pencil on the screen and they turn into text in whatever field text field you're in which seems like a kind of weird old newton feature almost but <laughs> having been there if you're working on something with the apple pencil there are so many times where you need to type a little bit of something in an app somewhere while you're holding the pencil and it becomes this thing where you have to set it down and then go and tap and then and then readjust back to holding the pencil and in ipad os 14 if you're holding the pencil and you need to input text in a, a search box or wherever you can just write it out and it that it gets converted into text. So that's actually, I think, a really nice usability feature. And then they've added a whole bunch of um, detection features where you can sort of, when you're in the notes app and you're writing and drawing, um, the text that you write is recognized and it's copyable and it's movable and it's copyable as either the handwriting or as the text that is underlying it. And previously, they only recognized handwriting for search but not for kind of sharing and editing. And they've rolled that in now too. So I think that's one of the banner features of iPad OS is, is just better use of the Apple Pencil. Yeah, definitely. Um, and now watch OS. Uh, this, of course, is, is I would say one of the most popular um, non-iPhone devices that I, I see people uh, really being into is, is the Apple Watch. And so what can people expect in the next version of watchOS? Well, there's some new fitness types because there always are. And there's some expansions <laughs> of, uh, of how complications and watch faces work that I think will be good. Apps can Right now, you can only put one app on a, on a complication on a face at a time, and now those apps can put multiple complications on watch faces. There's also the simplification going on where uh, they're adding a bunch of buttons, kind of floating buttons and navigation items and things like that. And a lot of times, uh, what, what they're, they're really doing is they're removing force touch, which is this idea that if you press hard yeah. on something, something different happens, which... I think we all knew at the time, it's surprising it lasted as long as it did. Um, they just, people don't know that it's there. And so they're getting rid of it. I would imagine the new Apple Watch that comes out in the fall won't support it. It'll actually let them make it thinner and lighter. So there's lots of good hardware reasons to get rid of it. So you'll see more buttons and, and pop-ups and overlays and things that are more obvious with the Apple Watch, which I think is a good thing. Yeah, overall, I will say um, as one of the folks who's you know, foolish enough to install this on some of their devices, um, you know, for testing. And I have been sure. a little weirded out about not being able to long press on notifications on the watch or, you know, force press on, on notifications on the watch face to uh, clear them. Having to scroll up instead has yeah. been a little strange. Well, so there are more. Get used um, to it. There are more swipe gestures now, too, which is a thing that they're lifting from the iPhone that you're going to be able to swipe on more items on the Apple Watch and uh, then tap to delete. Um, so they're they're rethinking it. But, yeah, there are a bunch of uh, those of us who've been using the Apple Watch for a while. There are a bunch of gestures that we're going to have to train ourselves out of. Definitely. Uh, and then I think at least among nerds, one of the biggest changes, um, at, well, there, there are multiple here. There's there's Mac OS Big Sur itself, which they are now calling, uh, for folks who don't know, it's been Mac OS 10 for a long time. Uh, and now it is, wait, is it? Yeah, OS 10, not o <laughs> yeah, OS X. See, I get confused. Um, and yep. now it's Mac OS 11, um, at least on certain computers. Let's not dig into the super de detailed stuff, but what is uh, 
the the changes that are coming to Mac OS Big Sur, as it were, and then the announcement that uh, people were expecting, but were still kind of surprised and interested in when it happened. Yeah, so they took OS 10 out of the branding of uh, Mac OS a couple of years ago. And now it's all about, uh, you know, now that it's Mac OS, they can safely make it version 11. Um, and then in terms of the rest of it, uh, you know, it's a visual redesign. So Mac OS is just, it looks very different than it did before. Um, and uh, there's a lot of speculation that what they're doing is making it look more like the iPad because the new Macs that run on Apple's chips, the same chips that are in the iPhone and the iPad, instead of running on Intel chips, will actually be able to run um, iPhone and iPad software as well. So they kind of want to unify it. So if you really love the iPad and wish that Apple made an iPad laptop, beginning probably at the end of the year, they'll be selling Mac laptops so that will run all your iPad software and Mac software. Yeah, it's a it's a pretty big, pretty big, pretty exciting thing. I I don't know uh, why, but I've always wanted to to be able to run some of the apps that I use on the Mac itself. So I'm definitely looking forward to that. And the the overall changes to Mac OS are certainly fascinating. Um, it it feels different, and it does feel more in line with what we can expect from uh, from the sort of unification of these different platforms. Uh, I guess the the one question that I would have to kind of lead things out, tip, so not typically, but sometimes folks will talk about the things that maybe Apple didn't announce on stage or they did, but sort of uh, glossed over. Are there any tidbits that you uh, want to, to talk about that maybe folks have missed if they're just looking at highlights or uh, anything that we should know based on what you've learned about uh, the keynote and the sessions post WWDC? I'd say that a lot of the fear that the Mac was going to change irrevocably and be locked down and not run any software you wanted, it has proven to be misplaced. Um, that that Apple, the new Macs with the new processors are just going to be Macs. They're not going to be anything more than that. They'll have some new features and things, but they're not the changes Apple made to get rid of old software, they already made them last year or the year before. So going forward, I'd say it, it, it's going to be as much as we're talking about Apple making all these changes to the Mac. In the end, I think the change is going to happen and people are going to say, oh, that wasn't much of a change at all. So mm -hmm. I think that's the big thing to take out of the reading between the lines this week. Beautiful. Well, Jason Snell, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Of course, folks can find your work uh, on sixcolors.com. But if people want to follow you online and check out any and all of your work, where do they go to do so? Uh, go to sixcolors.com, go to theincomparable.com, follow me at jsnell on Twitter. And uh, those are the best places to find me. Beautiful. Thank you so much for being my guest this week. I do appreciate you. All right, uh, folks, coming up, an update on the current state of facial recognition in the U.S. and around the world. But first, this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Barracuda. Barracuda is the provider of cloud-enabled enterprise-grade security solutions that protect email, networks, data, and applications. Suddenly, you have dozens, hundreds, or maybe thousands of employees working remotely, each one of them getting tons of emails every day, making them vulnerable. In fact, 91% of all cyber attacks start in an email. Spear phishing, ransomware, account takeover, conversation hijacking. Multiply that by how many employees times how many emails? One click on the wrong email can cost you money, it can cost you customers, and it can cost you your reputation. Barracuda researchers have seen a steady increase in the number of coronavirus-related spear phishing attacks since January, and they have observed a recent spike of 667% in this type of attack since the end of February. Yeah, 667%. You can get the protection you need for your company with Barracuda Total email protection. It includes all-in-one email security, backup, and archiving. 
It's AI-based protection from spear phishing, account takeover, and business email compromise. It's got an automated incident response that gives you options to quickly and efficiently address attacks and security awareness training so that you can educate your workforce so your employees can be the first line of defense against attacks. That's so important, especially when it comes to social aspects of these attacks. You know, there are loads of email threats out there and... I've gotten them myself. You get this message that your account has been compromised and you can, you know, click this link to make sure that you go to the right place uh, to reset your password. And suddenly you discover that it is not an actual legitimate place. There's all sorts of ways that bad actors can do uh, harm to you and your company. Right now, there are new attacks impersonating organizations like the World Health Organization. And attackers utilize domain spoofing and promise information relating to the coronavirus in an attempt to trick users into a phishing scam. Ensure the safety and security of your business with Barracuda. To uncover the threats hiding in your inbox, get a secure, free email threat scan of your Office 365 account risk-free at barracuda.com slash T-N-W. That's barracuda.com slash T-N-W, B-A-R-R-A-C-U-D-A dot com slash T-N-W. Barracuda, your journey secured. Our thanks to Barracuda for sponsoring this week's episode of Tech News Weekly. All righty, folks. <sighs> Uh, it is time for an update, as I said, on the current state of facial recognition, both here in the U.S. and uh, abroad. And it starts with an excellent new article from Dave Gershkorn over at One Zero, a medium publication. Dave, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me again. Yeah, it's a pleasure to get you back. So let's talk about... Um, there's there are kind of a lot of different uh, acronyms that we've got in, in this article, and I kind of want to break things down so that folks understand uh, what's going on here uh, so that we can talk about kind of th this company itself, uh, U2 Technology, and I'm sure you'll pronounce it better than I do there, uh, as well as the Entity List and then the uh, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. So can we just do sort of a, a rundown of these three entities to talk about what they are? Totally. So um, the one to start with is NIST. So NIST, um, since about the year 2000, has been doing this test on facial recognition algorithms. It's tried to inspire the industry to um, to make better algorithms. So it's run this little competition. And basically the competition is that submit your algorithms to us, we'll see which one is the best and we'll have a leaderboard. Um, pretty standard type uh, you know, competition uh, as far as tech goes. Um, then as you wade more into um, U.S. sanctions, there's the Bureau of Industry and Security. That's actually not in the article because it's a little bit deep. But what you need to know is that these two organizations are both a part of the U.S. Department of, Con of uh, Commerce. So you've got the test, and then you've got these this, the Bureau of Industry and Security. And they are um, the part of the Department of Commerce that deals with certain sanctions. So mm -hmm. in, in the 90s, there was this list called the Entity List. And it was meant to stop the proliferation of pro proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Um, so basically, if uh, you were suspected of, of having a, a dangerous material, you would be put on this list. It was seen as a sanction, as a public condemnation, and also U.S. companies need like a special permit to um, to do business with you. Ah. So it's seen as like a pretty sizable slap on the wrist. So now we're putting those, these two things together. Um, so you have NIST which is doing this facial recognition uh, competition, which in the last 20 years has grown to be enormous. It's the gold standard for facial recognition competitions in the world. Um, and a lot of companies uh, use it as marketing. So it's a, they got number one. They were in the top five. They were, you know, scored well on it. Um, but as tensions between the U.S. and China have escalated, um, you start seeing the U.S. government start to put sanctions on, on China, uh, including for human rights abuses in Xinjiang, which is um, mm -hmm. the uh, 
territory, the autonomous territory within China, um, home to Uyghurs, the Muslim ethnic minority. And there have been reports of them being put in uh, re-education camps, internment camps, and uh, it's estimated that more than a million Uyghurs are in these camps. So the Bureau of Industry and Security, part of the Department of Commerce, put a bunch of Chinese companies on this list, um, saying that they were perpetrating these human rights abuses. They were allowing video surveillance um, for Uyghurs. They had facial recognition that was specifically meant to identify Uyghurs. And then um, they put them on this list. And now uh, companies like MegV, which is one of uh, the China's largest facial recognition companies, was actually planning to IPO in the U.S. Hmm. I believe it was in the U.S. Um, but that didn't happen. And there's a lot of rumors that this is due to being put on this list. Um, and Meg has like protested and wants to get off the list. So while all of this has been happening, it's been business as usual at NIST. NIST is still ranking and auditing and giving free marketing to these companies that are uh, perpetrating human rights abuses. So the, the Department of Commerce is kind of has this double standard right now of both auditing and validating these tests or these algorithms, while condemning them, on the other hand. So I, I, it's one of those things where um, it's a multifaceted story, but at the heart of it, there's this, um, there's this conflict where you have the same organization condemning and like uh, approving the same kind of action. Right. Yeah. I have, I mean, so you've clearly drawn attention to this in, in, uh, publishing this article, but have either of these organizations addressed this specific issue here that we've got? Um, I mean, surely they have to know that, uh, this company is using, uh, the, the sort of gold seal, uh, from one of our organizations as a marketing tool is there any talk about why this is happening or have they tried to give some excuse for um, why these things are both allowed to happen? So NIST uh, didn't get back to me. They said they, that they were working on something and then didn't, was, weren't able to turn anything around. Um, but what political scientists have said is that it might be in NIST's best interest to continue doing this because there's an element of uh, transparency and understanding what China is doing with facial recognition. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, their companies aren't compelled to send their best facial recognition algorithms over if they want to keep some, you know, internal secrets or whatever. But um, some people suggest, like Samuel Curtis, who I, I spoke to for the story, that you know the price of um, the letting Chinese companies use this as marketing might be small compared to the competitive advantage that the U.S. has in just knowing what kind of facial recognition Chinese companies have. So, okay, that's interesting because the benefit then, it, whenever you originally had stated this, what I thought you were saying was that it's good for you at for the U.S. to sort of know what technology is being used for the sake of of sort of understanding, you know, uh, uh, potential adversaries, but instead it's more about, uh, being aware of technologies for the sake of, of competition. So less a, um, protection and human rights interest and more a matter of making sure that you are competing at the same level. I think it's both. I think it's definitely the human rights. And I mean, I think that, that like, so there are a few things. So I, I think that both of your points are completely like on the nose. Um, I think that it's definitely a human rights thing. It's definitely an accuracy thing um, and competition. It's also that uh, NIST has been doing um, tests on race and gender and uh, inclusivity in uh, these algorithms. And by having Chinese companies compete, it kind of brings them into the same conversation as mm. we're having in the U.S., which is um, should facial recognition algorithms be deployed if they don't work on a diversity of skin tones? Um, and I mean the counter argument to that is that like maybe you're just helping them make a better Uyghur detector. <laughs> you know, it's like right. so the, the, I think the the – there are so many questions that are still out there about this. And I think that the article that I tried to write was basically illuminating this conflict in the first place and then, mm -hmm. you know, acknowledging that there are still a lot of open questions about whether this should be 
whether this is actually a problem or whether it's something that's somewhat calculated from the U.S. government. We just don't know. Gotcha. Uh, now, how popular – because one of the things that I always find, and I think that um, you have brought this up before, is that the big companies, when it comes to facial recognition, are not often companies that we know. They, you, We think about um, Amazon and the Ring doorbell as one, but that's a small player in a very, in a much bigger uh, universe. And so it makes me wonder, you know, how much is this technology being used in uh, in China? Uh, is this a really popular technology, uh, the, the, the technology from U2? Um, uh, I'm curious about that specifically. Uh, is this something that, at least in China, is a very popular program and therefore a sanction does have a bigger effect versus sanctioning something that is maybe not used as much? Does that make sense? It does. And I think that the companies that the Uf U.S. have sanctioned are mm -hmm. the, you know, the biggest players in China. There's sense time, enormous. Um, U2 Technologies um, is in 1,500 banks, um, a, a specific bran branch of, of, uh, of banks in, in China that is incredibly popular. So um, it's not like these are small companies that no one's ever heard of. These are like considered among the AI giants of China. Um, gotcha. So they're, they're definitely big. I mean, it kind of, it depends how, how effective these uh, this blacklist is, it kind of depends from company to company because some of them don't necessarily rely as much on U.S. goods um, or U.S. IP, which is really what the the blacklist targets. So mm -hmm. um, it's kind of a, a company by company thing. But calling out these specific companies is definitely a big you know shot across the bow. And it happened days, I believe, before trade negotiations last year. So, I mean, it was it's undoubtedly seen as a political act. Makes sense. Um, all right. Well, let's uh, roll back the clock just a couple of days. Uh, you published an article uh, talking about a new coalition that is working on uh, sort of machine learning AI methods of trying to detect criminality. Um, it, it's called the Coalition for Critical Technology. And the group seems to be uh, saying – whoa, we need to slow down on this uh, this idea that we can detect criminal behavior using AI in specific ways. So let's dig into the details on this one because I think that's important in understanding. Um, first of all, before we even get to the group itself, uh, let's talk about the specific type of technology um, that we you know are discussing here. And it's kind of relation to phrenology overall. It's like modern phrenology, I think, is even uh, something that you noted in, in the piece. So what is this AI technology and what does it aim to do? Yeah, so as you noted, um, this is a – this kind of is a new iteration on a, a classic racist idea where you can measure um, physical attributes, um, including the, you know, size of someone's head or, you know, specific n nodes on their skull or, you know, uh, <laughs> the, the color of their skin or any of these things and come to some objective conclusion about um, their personality or their, um, you know, their, their uh, predisposition. Um, so this tries to do what people did in the 1800s with calipers, but with machine learning. Um, mm -hmm. And it's this is about the third or fourth example that we've seen, um, this specific one that's being called out. Um, the, the first one that I wrote about was, I believe, in 2016, 2017, um, when a group of scientists in, in China tried to predict criminality based on mugshots. Um, it turned out that the people who weren't criminals were wearing like white collared shirts. So if you ha were wearing a white collared shirt, you wouldn't be predicted as a criminal. And those are the little tiny things that like just prove that it's not I, it's like every every scientist agrees it's not possible. So <sighs> um, so this is kind of an iteration on that um, on, on phrenology, um, which has been widely disproven in pseudoscience. Um, and the idea is that 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 
the people who write these papers push is that it's an objective technology. It's math. How could it be biased? Um, but that's not the case. I mean, like it's it's just a, a while math itself is objective at times, the way that it's used is obviously not. So um, it is a a misinterpretation of the objectivity of science, um, specifically in this case to try and categorize people based on like completely arbitrary uh, traits. Right, because when you f – the whole way that artificial intelligence and machine learning works right now is – well, in, in these specific instances, I know that, you know, there's certainly a pedant out there who would say there are other ways. But um, in this specific instance, you feed a, uh, a model with 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 techno with results. And so it all depends on what you put into it. And so, like you said, if you have a bunch of people with white shirts who uh, are are, you know, free of being a criminal and then you decide that that the machine doesn't know that it shouldn't use that as a factor it then will find that uh comparison because it's looking for patterns and uh, yeah i i don't i suppose the thing that frustrates me the most about this is it just is it seems so easily understood to be illogical and yet um, we've seen, you know, folks try to uh, make something out of this. And, you know, there's the, the sexual orientation example as one and these different technologies that, are, that have existed. So uh, I find it hard to understand. And it appears that um, there are many an expert who feels the same way. Uh, more than 500 people have, have signed a letter uh, to say, look, we need to not be doing research uh, on this specific type of, of machine learning because it's simply not scientific. Uh, what's the name of this group? How do we know how long they've been around? And is this their first sort of um, push to bring an end to this uh, technology? Yeah, so the Coalition for Critical Technology is the name of the organization. Um, it's actually grown since the article published. Um, there are now more than 800 people who have signed, and these are all experts, academics, industry researchers, authors. Like some, if you read about algorithmic uh, bias and inequality, you've read the books of these people who are, who have signed on to it. Um, so uh, it has grown a lot, and this is the first kind of major thing that these people have um, kind of rallied around. It's apparently when I was talking to organizers, they said that it, that it all spawned from like one rage tweet when this uh, Harrisburg news <laughs> first came out. And then um, the, the coalition has grown and grown and grown since then. Um, and I think so there's also been an update or two uh, that was noted in the story. But I, I got another word from Springer Nature that um, said that Harrisburg erroneously said it was going to be published. Um, it was being reviewed, but not set to be published. And then it got mm. rejected in the peer review. Oh, good. So this was like, you know, kind of the, the system at work, but I think the overarching thing is that researchers want to, and you know, the experts on this, on this, uh, coalition want to say that this isn't acceptable ever. You know, this is just the <laughs> latest example in a, in a lot of, um, cases where this science is being misused there's no basis for it and it doesn't belong in in science. And it's not an issue. I mean the comments I've seen is like, oh, so you want to shut down debate? It's like, no, we want to stop having debates that we had 200 years ago. Like it doesn't work. It's done. Like it's, it's moved on. <laughs> We're doing other things now. Yeah. Well, it's over. <laughs> so – I, I think it's it's not a matter of like we're shutting down debate. It's just like you're debating old things that are irrelevant. Um, yeah. And the the industry wants to move on. The industry wants to stop being stuck in old, racist, um, ineffective methods and move on uh, to a more ethical way of doing science. Um, that's what I've been told. So, gotcha. um, so that that's that's the the read that I get that I get on it. Yeah. Uh, is so. The Coalition for Critical Technology in general, I, I suppose I'm curious uh, what what 
all encompasses critical technology. Um, is is that a matter, you know, in in defining this group, is it a matter of saying that, um, you know, the technology is is critical and so we are sort of looking at that or is it that they're being critical of technology? Um, I, I suppose the bigger question is kind of what all does this group want to focus on? Is it just for uh, AI and machine learning models like this or would this group potentially be kind of a uh, watchdog group of sorts for other means of, 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 of technology out there that can be used for harm? That is a great question. Um, and I would be lying if I said I knew exactly the scope of this organization. I know that it is a lot of academics that focus on machine learning, that focus on sociology, that focus on law. Um, and I think that something that they're very interested in is the creation and maintenance of carceral technology, you know, like according to what the group has kind of put out. And um, that means technology that um, is used to incarcerate people and might be biased or um, pitted against people of color, um, demographics that are not equally represented or underrepresented um, in technology, um, or reinforce racism and support the carceral state is what they say. So gotcha. um, I think that they are very focused on um, what they have called the tech to prison uh, pipeline. The tech mm. to prison pipeline. Um, okay. So that's everything I write about. So I'm sure we'll hear more about the more from them soon. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Dave Gershkorn, I want to thank you so much, uh, A, for joining me today, but also for your excellent work over uh, on One Zero. And I appreciate you keeping your eye out there and watching all this and letting us all know about it. Uh, if folks want to follow you online so they can stay up to date on your work, where do they go? Just go to one zero dot medium dot com. That's all you need to know. Just go to that Beautiful. every morning. <laughs> yes, yeah, start your, your day there. Page. Yeah, <laughs> it's a little bit oh. of a bummer sometimes, but it's a good website. Yeah, stuff you need to know. Uh, thank yeah. you so much uh, for joining me today. Appreciate it. Thank you. Alrighty, folks, uh, I'm going to round things out with a story of the week that I'm just going to tell all of you about. Uh, it, it is it fits the theme of what we've just of what we just uh, discussed, and it is an article from the New York Times that I think everyone uh, should go and check out. It's called "Wrongfully Accused by an Algorithm," and it discusses the um, the situation of uh, Robert Julian Borchak Williams, who got a call while he was at work and the Detroit Police Department uh, said, you need to come to the police department to be arrested. And he thought it was a prank call and he went home to his house. And while he was there, police pulled up behind him and arrested him in his front yard and brought him in and showed him photos uh, claiming that he had stolen, I think it was uh, up to $1,800 or maybe even more than that. Um, he had stolen a certain amount of, 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 uh, fun of money in, um, watches and other things from a local sort of boutique store. Uh, it turned out that he was not the person who did this thing. Um, this, of course, was after he had been fingerprinted printed and had his DNA entered into the uh, system. And it basically went back to a um, – th they were – investigating this, uh, this report and they put, he, they put up the images from the video into the surveillance video into the system and his driver's license came up as one of the potential people who it was. That information was forwarded to the police department and then the police department brought him in and, uh, sort of were trying to figure out if he had done it. Um, the police department says it has since updated its process so that facial recognition technology is not used in charging someone or arresting someone, but instead can only serve as an investigative lead. Uh, but this happened before that was the case. Um, and he's since figured out that he indeed had an alibi uh, as the 
the time that he was um, alleged to have stolen, he was in his car on his way home from work and had even posted an Instagram video um, proving as such. So there's a lot that's involved in this piece, uh, including the impact of this situation on his family and um, more information about sort of what happened and how this took place. And it is an excellent article that I think kind of um, is a good uh, summary of how the technology that Dave Gershkorn of One Zero uh, was just here to talk about can be used in a way that is um, harmful to people and uh, may predispose people in marginalized communities to being wrongfully accused of crimes. So please go read that article uh, if you have a moment. Uh, I would appreciate it uh, on a personal level, but also just it's it's an excellent article uh, by Kashmir Hill, who has been a guest on the show in the past. So uh, thank you all for tuning in this week. Uh, I do appreciate it. I know Jason wasn't here, uh, but I do appreciate you hanging out with me. Tech News Weekly publishes every Thursday at twit.tv slash TNW. If you head to twit.tv slash TNW, that's where you can go to subscribe to our show. We've got links to the show in both audio and video formats. So you just click on the one of your choice. If it's Google Podcasts, if it's uh, Spotify, if it's Overcast, wherever you go to listen to your podcast, you can head there. And of course, on YouTube as well, uh, if you want to check out the show there. You, of course, can be a part of the show by emailing us. It's tnw at twit.tv. And that reminds me, I think we just got an email the other day. Kate from Michigan emailed uh, to say, hey, thanks for your news on ADHD. I'm in my 70s. I've always loved books, but struggled with reading. Irritated at the Audible and library app changes, they emphasize books that have not been started, books that have started, and books that have finished. As I listen when I try to sleep, getting back to when I remember has become increasingly difficult. Audible is one of the places, Libby is another place, um, and wished that there was an easy way to listen instead of read directions and long magazine articles. So, Kate, I agree with you. That does become an issue. I'll often uh, be listening to a book as I'm falling asleep, and then I wake up in the morning and go, oh, no, where was I? I need to... So I usually set the sleep timer in the book, and then I can try to find my place within that chapter. Um, but I also agree with you, Kate, on the second part of your topic, which was that it would be so great if there was a simple way to listen to uh, any article on the web or listen to, you know, a set of directions for something as opposed to having to read it uh, on, on the screen. So, yes, uh, I do appreciate you writing in about uh, ADHD uh, in particular and happy um, that you felt, uh, you know, seen in, in us talking about that situation. So thank you. If other people would like to write in, it's tnw at twit.tv. And of course, follow Twit on social media. It's at Twit on Twitter, at twit.tv on Instagram, at Twit Talk on TikTok. I'm at Micah Sargent on pretty much all of the social things, or you can head to chihuahua.coffee. That's C-H-I-H-U-A-H-U-A dot coffee. And Jason Howell is at Jason Howell. Uh, of course, you can check out Hands on iOS. That's my show where I cover all things iOS and everything in between. Um, later today, my show will publish that shows you how to add custom fonts to your iOS devices so you can use those in apps that make use of fonts. Uh, and I believe we'll see uh, or already has been published um, the latest Hands on Android from Jason Howell. Thanks so much to John and Burke. And is that John and Burke? Is that all that's oh, there just, on that just, side? Just this John and Burke, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Thank you so forget, much. To Hands on Android, that did come out, was actually an episode on Stadia and actually trying to broadcast data through Android TV, which is a feature that isn't technically out yet for Stadia. It's actually a really mm -hmm. fascinating process trying to get that uh, broadcast to your TV. It's a little weird, but it works. Cool. All right. Well, there you go. Now you know. Thank you, John. Uh, and of course, we will see you next time on Tech News Weekly. Goodbye. Check out other shows here on Twit TV, including my show, Hands On Photography. On this show, I'm going to show you how to get the most out of your camera, as well as be a better post processor. So head on over to twit.tv hop and subscribe now. Thank you.